Hello, this is Ralph Edwards, and this is your life. Coming to you this time from the Maskers Club here in Hollywood, whose membership includes many of the greats of show business. Shortly, I'm going into the banquet room, where the Maskers will be paying tribute to the man who was field commander of the largest body of American combat troops in any war. Revered by his men, feared by his enemy, the quiet man who didn't know the meaning of the word defeat. We surprise our This Is Your Life guest in just a moment. This Is Your Life, an American tradition with Ralph Edwards, is brought to you by Lever Brothers. We just have a late entry here for the uh, dais that I'd like to call on. A uh, man that's been busy and just uh, arrived, so we'd like him to come out. And uh, it's a little late, but I'm sure you'll have something nice to say. Mr. Ralph Edwards. Uh, Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Pat Buttram. As I look at you maskers here tonight and your guests, I can see many of you to whom I could uh, walk right up and say, but there is one man here who perhaps more than anyone else in the world today deserves the accolade of greatness. General of the Army, loved and respected by his fellow officers and his often battle-weary soldiers, General Omar Nelson Bradley, this is your life. Well now, all right, please be seated. Please be seated. We are, uh, are you ready to be escorted to our stage, General? One moment. Now listen. Mr. Edwards, that's my job. The Jeep is ready when you are, General. Now, uh, General <laughs> Bradley, First of all, we're on national television, and that is a voice you haven't heard in 25 years. It belongs uh, to a man we finally found in Port Barry, Louisiana. He was your driver during the thick of World War II, Alex Stout, and here's Alex, right here. 25 years, uh, General Bradley, this is just one of many surprises we have in store for the Missouri farm boy who chose the Army as a career. Shall we go take him to the stage, Alex? Come on, here we go. Right this way. On stage now, we're in the standing set of the Maskers Club's current uh, play. I need hardly say that it has nothing to do with the heroic tale we're about to re relive here. General, yours has been a life of unequal service to your country, General Omar Bradley. You're one of only five men ever to hold the rank of General of the Army. Yet in the whole of your long career, you've never been one to push yourself into prominence. He was a knowledgeable and demanding officer, uh, Mr. Edwards. He had always considered and sensitive to the feelings of the individual. In uh, 1935, General Bradley, when you first heard that voice, you were a major assigned to West Point as an instructor in tactics. He, like you, is destined to leave his mark in history from Washington, D.C., General William C. Westmoreland. The first tactical situation was the defense of a key terrain feature against the Red Forces. Because I had deployed my forces poorly, the battalion was mauled somewhat severely by the Red Forces. You rode up alongside me on your horse and quietly said, move over, I want to talk to you. <laughs> and without a word of criticism, you emphasized to me my errors in employing the blue forces. But that day you taught me more than a lesson in tactics. Because by your example, you gave me a lesson in leadership. And this was a lesson never to be forgotten. Thank you, General Westmoreland. But in 1935, General Bradley, the seeds of greatness are being sown that were to culminate in one of your greatest triumphs. In 1969, you returned to the site of that triumph, Omaha Beach in Normandy, to pay tribute to the men who, under you, took this beachhead. 
What inner elements are there in a man that's bringing to brilliantly lead a million and a quarter men to victory? To grieve at their injuries as a father might grieve for his sons. To know and admire the young men he commanded. Where does it all start? Well, for Omar Nelson Bradley, it started in Missouri, Clark, Missouri, a small farming community on February 12th, 1893. Uh, what did your father do, General? He was a country school teacher. Yes, and he farmed too, didn't he? Yes, in the summertime he farmed and the winter he taught school. And uh, during the school term, with your dad away, the running of the farm has left your mother and you, a boy not yet in your teens. Uh, what were some of your chores, General? Well, feed the chickens and uh, milk the cow and uh, bring in stove wood. Mm -hmm. Always make sure that it had plenty of coal oil in the, for the lamps and have to go to the store and get that. Gather the eggs. Gather the eggs. The eggs that brought 10 cents a dozen in town. Your father dies when you're just 14. That's right. And you and your mother move to Moverly, a small railroad center, so you can attend high school there. You finished the regular four years of high school in just three years, Omer. That's the voice of a high school chum of yours, General, and here he is from Moberly, Missouri, Paul Stevens. <laughs> One summer, he unloaded uh, 40 ton cars for the Wabash Railroad Company with a scoop shovel <laughs> for 10 hours a day, six days a week. And you know what you made then? 13 cents an hour, Lord. 13 and a half. 13 and a half. 13 and a half, General Sam. Excuse me. All right. You know, the next summer, you got promoted. <laughs> You went to work in the boiler shop, and you got 17 cents an hour. <laughs> well, you're getting up in the world, General. Thank you, Paul Stevenson of Moberly, Missouri. Thank you. Yes, what did you say, General? Yeah, your wife, Ruth. Oh, yeah, Ruth's with you. You're going to see her right after. Yeah, Kitty's got a thing fixed afterwards, you know, where everybody kind of get together. When the time comes to attend college, General Bradley, you're faced with uh, financial problems, determined to work your way through, fortunately for all of us, your Sunday school superintendent, John Crewson, suggests the military academy, which doesn't require any money. You get an alternate appointment, wangle a railroad pass to get you to St. Louis, where you take your written examination at uh, Jefferson Barracks, right? Then one of the ifs that occur in everyone's life, almost leads to the Army's loss of a great commander. Would you tell us what happened to you during the mathematics exam, General? St. Louis at Jefferson's Ferry. Yes, well, I had received my appointment as alternate only eight days before I had to take the examination. I couldn't afford to quit working, so I only studied at night until I went down to St. Louis and uh, hadn't looked at a geometry book for three years. And if you ever try to quote geometry theorems after three years, you know what the trouble is. And at the end of four hours, I figured I'd just about made 67%, which is required to pass. And I must have been about right, because when school opened in the fall, they put us in sections according to the way we passed examination. And I was in the 24th section out of 28 in mathematics, <laughs> and the 27th in history, and 27th in English. You passed the examination, as you say, and in August 1911, General Bradley, you enter the United States Military Academy at West Point and launch your distinguished military career. One of your classmates at the academy and one of your friends there and thereafter was a well-remembered fullback on the Army football team, a brilliant soldier, commander of the Joint United States Military Advisory and Aid Group in Greece, and later commander of the United Nations Forces in the Korean War. 